This simple screenshot costs about $60,000 to set up because we got two servers to talk to each other at 400 gigabit ethernet speeds. Now, of course, we did the budget option of this as well with InfiniBand and we managed to get that cost down to about $6,000. And the reason that we set up the 400 gig ethernet and InfiniBand connections was really just because it's new and exciting. In fact, you would need the newest processors, the Intel Xeon Sapphire Rapids and the AMD Epic Genoa just to be able to really do this out of a single socket. Let me put it a different way. This is an Intel Xeon Platinum 8280. We also did the 8380H on the STH main site, which was Cooper Lake. They were basically the fastest Intel Xeon processors you could buy in Q1 of 2021. If you had either of those processors, neither of them has a PCIe bandwidth to drive a single 400 gigabit ethernet link. That's how fast this networking is, guys. And I'll tell you that the journey to even just get all this stuff working was not as simple as like, oh, plugging one in and everything's working easily. It was far from that. And I thought, why don't we go and just share the experience and share what all the components are. We got some really cool things like we actually have the Broadcom Tomahawk chip that we can show you. We have a 64 port, 400 gig ethernet switch behind me. And I figured, hey, a lot of folks haven't seen this. So let's just go show you all the different components and talk about what we learned in the process. So with that, let's get to it. Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH and this is the Broadcom Tomahawk 4. This giant chip powers 64 400 gigabit ethernet connections. If you're like a cloud service provider, this is the type of switch chip you're probably gonna use. In this video, we're gonna talk about the main components of that 400 gig networking, including this fiber store switch over here, which has 64 400 gig ethernet ports. We're gonna talk about the NVIDIA Connect X7 cards that we used, both in ethernet and in FiniBand mode. We're gonna talk about optics, which are expensive and also cables, which are surprisingly expensive and not very flexible and very hard to work with. And if you haven't seen this already, we're not just gonna show you like the front panel of the switch and say like, oh, here's some ports. Uh, no, no, we've, uh, we've taken it apart and we even have things like the giant heatsink that cools the switch chip. And before we get too far in this, I just wanna say a big list of thank yous. We have thank yous to the companies that supported us getting this all together. Also, uh, you know, we had a phone a friend, I'll tell you about that story in a second because things were just not working at all. And I also wanna say thank you to the STH YouTube members for helping us buy things like these DACs and stuff that we needed to get this all put together. Okay, so the first thing and the reason that this cost so much money to connect to is because we didn't just do a direct connection like we did with the InfiniBand side. On the ethernet side, we went through a switch. That switch is over here. This is the fs 95 d this switch is like a four rack unit height. So it's not a normal one rack unit or two U switch that we see, especially on high speed switches. This is a total of four U and a big part of that is just for the cooling. On the front of the switch, you can see that we have our out of band management port as well as a serial console port. And then we also have our 64 QSFP DD ports. Now you may have seen something simple like a 100 gig QSFP 28 optic. I mean, these things have been around for a long time. They're fairly inexpensive these days. A QSFP DD one tends to be um, um, a lot bigger because they use, I think like up to like 12 or so watts of power. So you're just gonna kind of see the difference in size between these two. And these things are still very expensive, starting about $500 and going up from there. We had a quick review of these that we'll link in the description on the STH main site a little while ago. Now, moving to the back of the system, there are some wild things as well. For example, the first thing you're gonna see is that the fans on this switch are not small. This is a fan unit from the back, and there are a total of eight of these on the back of the chassis. They're nice little hot swap units, which is awesome, and they're there just to pull air through the chassis. The power supply situation is also kind of interesting. There are a total of four 1.3 kilowatt 80 plus platinum power supplies. This would be the kind of power supply you would use to power like an entire dual socket, pretty high-end server as of today, and, and, and there are four of these powering this switch. Now, the reason that you need four of these 1.3 kilowatt power supplies is to provide redundancy because this switch's maximum power consumption rating, which we didn't get anywhere near, just shy of 2.6 kilowatts. And looking at the outside of this giant switch is fun, but like, let's get that probe going and let's go look inside a switch that costs as much as a pretty nice car. Okay, so let's take a look inside the switch and like, let's take a look at what we would see first if we took the probe lens and put it through the rear of the switch, we would see the management CPU. And this module also has the memory on board. I think it has like eight gigabytes of memory. The management processor that runs on here is an Intel Xeon D1627. 
And that is a four core, eight thread Xeon D processor like you'd see in a edge server or something like that, except it's in this case, running our switch. You also see next to that module that we also have an M.2 SSD. That's a 240 gig SSD. And you can put two of them in there. So if you do, I guess, need to expand the storage on your switch, you could totally go do that. Now, something that's a little bit different on this switch versus other switches that we've seen is that this has two different levels of PCB. There's one that has that management controller and also the power input, I guess, from the power supplies, as well as like the power output to all the fans and stuff like that. And so that's kind of like one side of it. And then the second board is powered and connected. And that is the one that has our Broadcom switch chip. So when we first opened up the system in Solid State, it was, it was pretty cool to see this just giant heatsink here. But what we couldn't see was like the QSFP DD cages. So what we did was what you would imagine, and we managed to take off the giant heatsink. This is the heatsink just for the switch chip, guys. And under there, we found a switch chip that was socketed. Now that is extremely uncommon, guys. The vast majority of like, you know, 100 gig switches and 200 gig switches that we've reviewed so far, and even some of the, we have actually looked at a 32 port 400 gig switch a couple years ago. And, and all of those switches had soldered switch chips onto the PCB, right? This is the first one that we've seen that's actually socketed. And since it was in a socket and we saw it, we said, hey, why don't we go pull that out? I bet you folks haven't seen one of these before. And then I found one on eBay that uh, you know I was able to go buy and so I can actually have it here to show you. But anyway, this is the Broadcom Tomahawk 4. This switch chip can push, I think like, 51.2 terabits per second of traffic over it. I mean, that's insane, guys. The forwarding capacity, I think it's something like, like 10.3 billion packets per second or something like that. Just insane numbers. And beyond all the ports, there's even like 113 megabyte packet buffer on this. I mean, there's just crazy stuff here. And so what I want to do just for fun here is this is a, a Broadcom Tomahawk 4. This is a fourth generation Intel Xeon scalable codenamed Sapphire Rapids. And you just kind of see the size comparison here. Uh, another one that I thought would be fun to kind of show you is the uh, Ampere Ultra. So we don't have we don't have the Ampere one at the time that I'm recording this video, but this has a 128 arm cores and you can see that it is dwarfed by the Broadcom Tomahawk 4. This over here would be like an AMD Epic Milan generation. So Epic 7003. So this is a 64 core part. You can see again, the Broadcom is way bigger. And maybe the only chip that comes remotely close uh, is the AMD Epic 9004 Genoa comes somewhat close, but I can tell you just sitting here that the AMD one is nowhere near as big as the Broadcom. Now, if you do buy one of these switches, do not disassemble it yourself. This was a bad idea and it just kept happening. I don't know what to tell you, but I just wanted to show you guys what it looks like. And I'm probably gonna get in a lot of trouble for that, sorry. Now in front of the switch chip, what you're gonna see is that array of QSFP DD cages. Now, one of the big challenges with 400 gig networking is just cooling. The specs for these modules are like, you know, up to like like 12, and depending on what kind you're using, like up to like 15 watts and stuff like that. And so like when you have 64 of those things and you know, you're generating like say around a kilowatt or so of just, you know, optical module, like power consumption, uh, that, that takes a lot to cool. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about these differences in a second, but I just wanna show you guys this on the, the DAC side, right? So uh, the direct attached copper side, you have, uh, this is a QSF PDD here. You can just kind of see what this thing looks like. It's a pretty darn beefy Cisco cable here. Now, the other one I wanna show you is OSFP. So there's QSF PDD, which the switches and what some of the stuff that we've seen, like the optics and stuff have been, but then there's also OSFP, which has a higher power limit. And uh, one of the other things that's fun about that spec is that it also uh, often includes a heat sink directly on here. So instead of having where we have the heatsink on the cage in the switch, instead it's actually on the module itself. So this is a example of the DAC cable that has its own heatsink. That's wild. Okay, so let's talk about the server side for a sec before we talk about uh, actually connecting these things because uh, that, that was a whole ordeal in itself. So the first thing on the server side, what we used was we used two Supermicro servers. The reason that we used Supermicro Intel Xeon Sapphire Rapid servers is just because frankly, it's a little bit easier to do tuning on the Sapphire Rapids than it is on the AMD Epic Genoa. If you didn't know this, the AMD Epic like Milan, if you want to do like really high speed networking, you probably had to do uh, quite a bit of tuning and Genoa uh, has fixed a lot of that in this generation, but it still is just a little bit easier to tune higher speed networks on the Xeon side. So that's kind of why we used it. The other thing just to think about though, is that it is also way easier to use a single socket server these days versus dual socket servers. So that's why a lot of cloud providers, for example, are using single socket 
its servers these days. To give you just some sense of how much bandwidth a 400 gigabit connection takes, it, it's somewhere in the ballpark, I think, of like maybe two DIMM slots, right? So I mean, like the amount of traffic that you can generate if you're trying to go from like one socket over to the other socket, uh, it's just, it's just actually a ton of bandwidth if you're trying to push stuff like, you know, 400 gig stream across, right? And in our $60,000 figure, we're not even including the cost of the servers here, guys. Now in both of these servers, we needed to find a PCIe Gen 5 by 16 slot to be able to drive one port of 400 gigabit ethernet traffic. And frankly, finding 400 gigabit ethernet adapters is not that easy, but we managed to get two ConnectX7, so NVIDIA ConnectX7 adapters, and PNY helped us get those so we actually could show you 400 gig networking. I think uh, NVIDIA is gonna get us some soon, but uh, they, they didn't arrive in time, so that's why we're using these. Now, the pair of adapters that PNY sent are single port adapters, but they have a neat little trick. Each adapter can run either 400 gigabit ethernet or they can run InfiniBand. We have a little bit on how to change that on the STH main site. Overall, the installation was super easy. And if you've used like Mellanox NVIDIA cards over the years, uh, th this is a very similar setup. It's just normal, like their normal VPI setup, all that kind of stuff. So I, I think that, you know, for folks that are nervous about like, oh, do I have to get like weird, weird things in my server to be able to run 400 gig networking? Once you have a modern server, it's actually pretty straightforward if you've done server administration before. So that brings us back to our QSF PDD and OSFP discussion, because NVIDIA doesn't use the kind of normal OSFP connector that like looks like kind of like this, where you have the integrated heatsink. Instead, they use a flat one that does not have the integrated heatsink. You might ask, why is that a problem? Well, if you have a heatsink that's integrated into your module, it physically does not plug into the port at the back of the server where you're trying to port, you know, plug your NIC into. And pretty much all of the OSFP attachments that we found online uh, all had the heatsink. So NVIDIA is just doing something that's a little bit different here. So we had a friend that works in the industry that uh, we can't say who that was or where they work because uh, they would get in trouble if we did. But I just want to say thank you to that individual. You know who you are. They came in with the cables that we needed and the optics we needed to get this all set up. And since we didn't have an NVIDIA Quantum 2 InfiniBand switch, we went with the simple topology. We just got the flat OSFP cables and we connected them together. And by doing that, uh, you know, we had a very simple point to point topology. So we ran our InfiniBand speed test and we didn't necessarily get all the way up to 400 gigs, but we definitely got well over 300, showing that at least we had a working setup linked at the right speeds. Now, each of the Connect X7 cards, I think is like $1,800 or so, and a direct attach cable is somewhere in like maybe the $350 to maybe $600 range. So it's not a cheap setup, but it is very, very fast. But since we had the switch and we wanted to use the switch, then we had to figure out how to be able to bridge the QSF PDD and the OSFP, and that required some kind of funky optics that finally our phone and friend got working, but that took a while to get working, and we got like a couple of runs of this thing, and then we literally it was like, okay, it ran, okay, we got some numbers that are over 300 gigs a second, we can't, we don't have time to do tuning because these things have to go back like right now before the FedEx man shows up, so literally like we're done testing, threw them in the box, and they were back. So that was the basic hardware that we needed to be able to get to 400 gigabit connections between these two. And the reason it cost like $60,000 to do the ethernet version was because we had a $55,000 switch in the middle, only connecting two, which was of course silly. And it created a ton of like challenges just because it would have been easier just to have a direct attached cable between them. But we still did it just to be able to say we did. Now in all of our videos, I like to have a key lesson learned. Like what do we learn by doing this? Number one, I think it was just cool to go and use the 400 gig ethernet. 400 gig ethernet, I think a lot of folks are gonna say like, oh, I'm good with 100 or like, why do we care or anything like that? And I think, you know, there are a couple things. Like one, this is the first time that we can really handle a 400 gig NIC with PCI Gen 5 in the modern servers. Now, not many folks have 400 gig networking connections outside of the data center, but within the data center, having the ability to have 400 gig, if you're doing things like AI, if you're gonna do things like have storage delivered over the network, and if you think that like 400 gig is way too much for a server, just think about it this way. Like if you had an Intel Xeon Platinum, like a Cascade Lake or Skylake or, you know, something like that, where you had a PCIe Gen 3 by 16 slot that you put 100 gig NIC in, well, then, you know, you might have pretty commonly like a 24 core CPU, right? They went up to like 28 cores. And so if you have a 24 core CPU and 100 gig networking, well, that's basically the same ratio as having a 400 gig network card on an AMD Epic Gen 1 96 core part. Now, while you might be thinking that this 400 gig speed is completely crazy. The other way to think about it is it's really just trying to keep up with the core count growth that we're seeing in modern servers. 
And the other big thing with having a 64 port, 400 gig ethernet switch is what happens when you do breakout, right? Each 400 gigabit port has four 100 gig ports basically in it. So if you can break that out, that means that you could have 256 100 gig connections into a single switch. And that means that you can have a much smaller like switch and like networking radix and that uh, lowers power consumption, lowers costs, all that kind of stuff. So that's how, you know, these guys that are using this type of hardware are really justifying those costs. You can either go faster to the switch or you just need way fewer switches in your data center. So just as a, another quick fun thought for your discussion, if you think about it, if you remember a couple years ago, we had like 40 gig networking and everybody's really excited. Like, oh, you know, we have one gigabit networking in our desktops, but nowadays that same ratio kind of holds, but that 40 to one ratio would mean that you would need like 10 gigabit on every desktop. So if you want to know why on STH we're pushing two and a half gig so much, it's just because like one gig just feels like it's way slow compared to modern servers. And frankly, two and a half gig feels a little slow too, but that's, you know, due to the wiring that's in walls. Hey guys, I hope you like this look at 400 gig networking. This, uh, this, this thing costs a lot of money for us to put together, even though folks were sending hardware and stuff. I mean, this costs a lot of money to do. So I just want to say thank you again to the STH YouTube members for really making this one possible. And if you did like this video, well, why don't you check out one of our other videos? Like we have videos on two and a half gig networking if you just want something that's a little bit more mundane. And while you're at it, why don't you give this video a like, click subscribe and turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching and have an awesome day.